Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome those uh, of you here in person conducting the worship services and those of you joining us online to the worship service of the Streetsboro Church of Christ in Streetsboro, Ohio. We pray that you will join in our worship to God and you will be uplifted and encouraged uh, by doing so. We also pray that we are true to the word and that our worship will be pleasing and acceptable to God. If any of you have any questions about why we do what we do or what we teach, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. In the way of announcements this morning, got a lengthy list. Um, first of all, for the sick, uh, please keep in prayer the following. Tara Vargo, who is facing some upcoming surgery. Uh, Tish's sister, Carolyn, and brother-in-law, Jim, who both have COVID. They are doing a little bit better. Beth West, sister to Emily's friend, Maria, uh, had her thyroid removed last week. The doctors do believe they got all the cancer. Let's continue to keep her in prayer and pray that they did get all the cancer. John Scotton uh, has recovered from COVID. Uh, Teresa is doing better, but still weak. And I'd like to add my Aunt Mary Laverne Wood. Uh, that was my dad's sister, and uh, she has COVID and double pneumonia. We also had quite a few deaths um, from, of relatives and friends. Uh, so keep all of these families in your prayers. The Spences and the loss of their cousin, husband, Lori Nash's husband, Tommy, who passed away last week. Bobby, keep him in prayer as well. He'll be doing the graveside service. Also, Lyrica Fern, who is a friend of Hazen's, uh, passed away last week. Katie Murdoch, a friend of Travis's, passed away last week. John Armentrot, uh, a friend of Kay's, passed away. And Harold Cantley, a member from Elyria. So keep the families of all these people in your prayers. Oh, okay, the bulletin was incorrect. Uh, sorry, John Armentrot did not pass away. Uh, he had... Sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll get confirmation from Kay. Um, upcoming events. Uh, don't really have anything except for the fact that we, as it stands right now, we do plan to resume in-person worship services uh, on the 17th and in-person Bible study on Wednesday night. Uh, on January 20th. So mark those down and plan to gather back together as a congregation on the 17th, Sunday morning at 1045 for worship, and then Wednesday on the 20th for, at 730 for Bible study. Is there any other announcements? Okay, let's begin our worship. Good morning. morning. Our first song will be 694. 694. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way. 694. To Canaan's land, I'm on my way.
Song 447, 447, near to the heart of God, 447. Let's pray. Dear anyway, Father, we're so thankful for we, this opportunity we have to be together, to worship you. We realize that uh, the situation is different in our age and pray that you will uh, be mindful of all your servants, wherever they may be, and especially those who seek to worship and to glorify you. We realize there are several that are sick and those who are facing procedures and whose health is uh, very tentative at this time. We pray that you will be with them. We pray that you will be with those who look after them. We pray that you will help us to remember at these times uh, where our faith is really supposed to be, and that's in you, and where our hope lies, and that's in the eternal home with you. We're also mindful of those who have lost loved ones and know that there are people that are grieving over these losses, and pray that you will strengthen them and that you will help them during these difficult times as they have lost people that are precious to them. We pray that you will help us uh, as we interact with one another, that we be mindful of those who are suffering, and that we will do all that we can to lift one another up. We're thankful for the church. We're thankful for the congregation here, uh, for the elders and the deacons, for Ralph, for preaches, and all those who work hard to uh, try to conduct uh, a service here uh, to try to make sure the light is shining in this community. We pray that you will bless this congregation. We pray that you will strengthen us, that we may be able to reach more people during this difficult time than maybe we've ever reached in times past. 
We pray to be with our nation, with our leaders. We know that there is much turmoil. We pray that you will be with our leaders, that they will do the things that are right. We pray that you'll help them, that they will look to your word and follow it. We know that there are leaders out there that would lead us astray. We pray that we will have the courage to look to your word and put our trust in you and to always follow you regardless of these others. We pray that you will be with us as we worship you together, as we sing songs, offer prayers, and partake of the Lord's Supper, to give of our means, to hear a message from your word. We know that there are things in our life that are competing for our time, that are interfering with our concentration. We pray that you will help us to be able to concentrate, to focus on these things that are truly so important. We're so thankful for your son who was willing to come to this earth to live a perfect life as a sacrifice for us, to teach us the way that we should be and to uh, reveal your will for us through the New Testament and all the provisions that have been made. We pray that we'll be mindful of these great things, that we will not let them slip, and that we will be mindful of the great sacrifice that he made for us. Again, we're so thankful for all the blessings that we have both physical and spiritual, especially the blessings that we have through your Son. And in his name we pray. Amen. Our next song will be 714. 714. Trust and obey. 714. Supper, we'll sing song number 12. Song number 12. For this song, we'll sing the first, second, and last first, and then the chorus. First, second, last, and then the chorus. Was it for crime? 
this morning as we gather around this table to remember our Savior Jesus. We need to remember that this is a memorial that was not set up by man, but was set up by Jesus himself. And we can read of that uh, throughout the Gospels. And one place is in Matthew 26, 26 through 29, which reads, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and giving it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. <clears throat> so as we take this time each Lord's Day to uh, remember our Savior Jesus, I want us to consider a few things as we partake of the Lord's Supper. And um, this was adapted from an article that I read by a man by the name of Eric Raymond. And he says, as we partake of the Lord's Supper, let us look up. Since God has invited us to this table, it's appropriate for us to acknowledge that he is central. He invites us to the table through Christ. When you partake of the Lord's Supper, look up and consider who God is. He is, unchanging, he is an unchanging God who is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. He is the God who loves even you and even me, and he has planned for man's salvation through Christ before the world began. Let us look in. When we look up at who God is, then we have a better view of ourselves and who we should be. The supper gives us this opportunity. In 1 Corinthians, Paul gives us instructions for the church when they partake of the supper. 1 Corinthians 11, 27, and 28 read, Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Thirdly, let us look back. The Lord's Supper points us back. Jesus uses these simple elements this bread and this fruit of the vine to remind us of his broken body and his shed blood, the blood that was spilled for us. And this is a time to look back, to reflect on what Jesus has done for us. And finally, let us look ahead. We can look ahead to the time when we will spend eternity in heaven because of Christ's death on the cross. Because of his death, we can have the forgiveness of our sins we can be in a right relationship with our Father in heaven, and if we remain faithful, we will have that home in heaven. Let us give thanks for this bread. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day, this Lord's day that you have blessed us with, for this opportunity to be here to worship you, to gather around this table to remember our Savior Jesus Christ, to remember his great love for his willingness to leave his home in heaven with you, to come to this earth and to suffer and to die for each one of us, to have his body broken and his blood shed that we might have the forgiveness of our sins and that great hope of heaven with you someday. We pray, Heavenly Father, as we take this time that we will reflect on you, reflect on Jesus, and reflect on our lives and our service to you, Heavenly Father, and that we might strive to live faithful to you, that we can have that home in heaven. We pray now that you bless this bread as we partake of it, remembering our Savior's broken body. We pray that we might take this in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father in heaven, we approach your throne once again, thanking you for this day, thanking you for this, uh, again, this opportunity to be around this table to remember our Savior Jesus. 
We're thankful, Heavenly Father, for this fruit of the vine that represents his shed blood, that precious blood that washes away our sins and makes us white as snow and makes us to be able to be in a right relationship with you. And we pray that you would bless this cup, Heavenly Father, and each one who partakes of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper, and at this time we take opportunity to give back to our Lord as we've prospered, as we've reflected on certainly what is most important and what God gave us and Christ gave us, and that's salvation through our Savior Jesus. We reflect on the things that we have in this life that help us to get through each day. Just finished 2020 and beginning 2021, and I'm sure we can all think back, even though we've gone through some trials and uh, many have gone through a lot of sickness, and we can still think about how we've been blessed in this life and what God provides for us. And uh, we know that everything that we have comes from God, everything good comes from God, and that He'll take care of us and provide for us and be there for us in whatever we need. And we take this time each Lord's Day to um, reflect on those blessings and to lay by in store as we've prospered and to give back to God and we might carry out his work here on this earth and um, we pray that uh, we've taken the time throughout this week to think about our blessings and uh, have prepared to give back to God today and at this time we'll remember the ways that you can give uh, those here can give in the box in the back and uh, again we can mail the contribution in or make arrangements to meet someone here at the building to uh, be able to do that. This time, let us pray. Father in heaven, we're mindful of you and how you bless us and take care of us and uh, provide all those things that we need, uh, the physical things to get through this life. We know that you've promised through your word to provide the necessities of this life, and we know that we are often blessed beyond that, Heavenly Father, and have much more than we need and we just pray that we use those blessings that you give us in a way that's pleasing in your sight we might be good stewards of all that you provide for us heavenly father and be able to help those around us that may be in need and to be a comfort to them in whatever way that we can we pray that as we take this opportunity to give back to you that we do so cheerfully heavenly father and that you would bless this offering and pray that it might be used in a way that would uh, benefit you and your kingdom here on this earth and that we can reach out to the, the community and to the world and to help them to see the need to be in a right relationship with you. We ask now that you again bless this offering and those who give at this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Next song will be 730. 730. What a friend we have in Jesus. 730.
you're following along with the songbook and would like to mark the song of encouragement, that would be 197, 197, have thine own way, Lord. Before Brother Ralph's sermon, we'll sing song 84, number 84, Bring in the Sheaves. Sing only the first two verses of 84. 84. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in the noon high and the dewy, waiting for the harvest and the time of reaping, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing. Song encouragement week eighty four, number eighty four. All right, good morning. Glad to have you here with us. The few that are here, we're glad to have all of those with us who are uh, watching online. I'm told uh, by the ones who are doing our stream that usually we're over 100 with those who are um, watching online. You figure some, most of those have more than one person, so we, we have pretty good attendance online for our worship services, and, and we hope that they are beneficial to you. Before I get into my lesson, there are two things I need to say. First of all, we do have confirmation that John was right. Believe it, believe it or not, <laughs> John says, so, of course I was right. Um, John Armentrout did pass away, so we're sorry to hear that. He passed away from congestive heart failure, so keep his family in your prayers. And then the other one is um, an announcement that I neglected to um, get in the bulletin. And that is that my father-in-law, Jack Jones, his niece, Chrissy, um, had a severe reaction to the COVID vaccine and ended up in the ICU. Um, we hear that she is doing better and is actually home now. Still, still has some of the symptoms, but they're getting better. So uh, keep her, Chrissy, in your prayers um, as she's dealing with that. Everyone has one, whether we realize it or not. Some are good, some are bad. Sometimes the one that we have is deserved, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes what we have is, is accurate, and it is not. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a, our name, or we could say our reputation. All of us have a reputation. Whether we want one or not, those around us form opinions about us based upon our behavior that they see. And we as children of God, we need to be cognizant. We need to be aware of that fact and aware of the image that we are putting forth because we know that ultimately we are to be a reflection of Christ in the world around us. Therefore, if we are not living as we should and our reputation is not what it should be, then we are doing Christ a disservice. 
as we begin to think about this, let's think about a definition of the word reputation. A simple definition is it's the overall quality or character as seen or judged by people in general. So we all are very complex people and, and we have strengths and we have weaknesses. But when we're talking about a person's reputation, the scriptures often use the term their name. We're talking about um, an overall quality, maybe a predominant quality that people see in you on a daily basis. And so you develop a reputation based upon that, maybe that predominant quality that you have. Of course, we know that, you know, there are good reputations to have. You may have an up, a reputation as an honest person, as a person who is a hard worker, a person who's loyal and dedicated, or, or something along that nature. But we also know that you can have a bad reputation. People have reputations sometimes as a person who is untrustworthy or a liar. Maybe you have a reputation as being lazy or untrustworthy or self-centered, you know, and again, maybe that reputation is deserved and maybe it's not. That's the nature of a reputation. It's other people's perception of you. And sometimes those perceptions, of course, are inaccurate. The question is, though, and I've sort of already answered this, should we as Christians worry about our reputation in the world, how other people see us? And really, my answer is yes, but there is a qualification to that. Yes, to a certain extent. Now, you know, there are two extremes to this question. Should I be concerned about how other people see me? One extreme is no. You don't need to worry about how other people view you. You be who you're going to be. You live how you want to live. And other people can draw their opinions, and that's their right. But I, you, you don't have to worry about it. Don't care. Don't worry about what other people think. We see this type of mentality a lot of times in the very famous uh, in the world because we know when a person becomes famous, suddenly everyone in the world has an opinion on their conduct, on their behavior, and, and it could drive a person crazy, all of the different opinions and, and false statements that are out there in regard to them. And so a lot of times individuals who have a lot of popularity, a lot of fame, they, they wall themselves off and they do not worry at all what people think about them. And, and to an extent that's understandable. There are also those, though, who are at the other end of the spectrum, and reputation really is, is all that matters to them. They are obsessed with how others feel about them, and this certainly is prevalent in our society as well. You think about all of these social influencers and people who are trying to gain followers and trying to you know, have and project forth a certain image to the world around them. And so they're very, very concerned about their reputation in the world. And unfortunately, many times their desire to have a certain name or reputation, it has led in the past people to compromise sometimes their beliefs, their morals uh, in obtaining that reputation. And I've found many times, unfortunately, that those who fall into this category and worry so much about what others think of them, many times it's because they don't even really like themselves, unfortunately. And, and they're trying to make themselves into what they think others want them to be. But so there are those two extremes. Don't care at all what other people think and then care extremely to a, to a high extent what other people think about them. For the Christian... The answer is somewhere in between there, is where we need to be as Christians. We, we need to be concerned with how other people view us. And I think the scriptures bring that forth because the scripture does talk about the importance of having a good name, having a good reputation in the world around us. For example, Proverbs 22 and verse 1, Solomon said, A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. Loving favor rather than silver and gold. Also, Solomon would write in Ecclesiastes 7.1, A good name is better than precious ointment in the day of death and the day of one's birth. As we think about um, the importance of reputation, another passage that comes to mind is when Paul is, by inspiration, giving us the qualifications for a bishop, for an elder. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, I, you know, Don Treadway, the preacher who baptized me, he, he often would say that 
when he is when he talks or preaches about the eldership, he, he would say that he views an elder as a person that you can point to and say, I want my son to grow up to be like you, like that person, like that, that individual. And I think, you know, there's a lot of truth in that statement. One of the qualifications of an elder, though, according to Paul, who was writing by inspiration, is that he needs to have a good reputation. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 7 in regard to a prospective bishop, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. What does it mean to have a good testimony among those who are outside? That's, that's talking about a reputation that even outside the church, an elder needs to live in such a way that, that they are known as men of principle and they are admired and respected for their qualities and again, if, if that, though, is a quality that God desires for elders and we are to follow the example of our elders, then certainly that's a quality that we need to strive for as well. We need to be concerned with how others view us because, again, when they look at us, in their eyes they're looking at Christ as well if they know that you are a Christian. But we also need to realize that sometimes others are going to form opinions of us uh, that we have no control over. And we cannot allow ourselves to be overly concerned with that. There will always be those in the world who will try to ruin your reputation, will try to say things about you and make people think things about you that are not the case. There will always be those who, as long as there are those who are trying to slander you, there will also always be those who are willing to listen to lies that are spoken about, about you or about others. Remember what was said, uh, uh, what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11. He says, what, to what shall I like in this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to their companions and saying, we played the flute for you, you did not dance. We mourned you and you did not lament. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is justified by her children. Jesus points out there that he and John both had reputations. And those reputations were not based upon fact. They were not accurate, repu accurate representations of their reputation, I guess, if, if you want to say that. They say, they say John has a demon. He's crazy. Not eating or drinking. You remember his lifestyle that he lived in the wilderness. And then Jesus was, was sort of the opposite. He did not uh, closet himself away in the wilderness, uh, but rather, you know, he, he, he was among the people attending the wedding feast in Cana of Galilee and other things like that. And they say, oh, he's a glutton and a wine bibber. And so there are those who will spread lies and those who, if you do live as you're supposed to live, will try to soil your reputation. We can't control that. And therefore, we should not overly worry overly much about that because there are always going to be those. If it happened to the most perfect person who ever lived, Jesus himself, certainly it will happen to you as well. Jesus also said in Matthew 5.11, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Okay, so he warns us, not if they speak evil against you and persecute you, but when, when it happens, he says, blessed are you, approved of God, if you are spoken evil about and people tell lies about you. Also, Peter warned us that that would be the case. 1 Peter 4.4, 4, he says, in regard to these, he's talking about, the ungodly people of the world. In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. When the world sees you trying to live according to the teachings of Christ, trying to improve and better yourself, many times simply out of jealousy or aggravation with you, they will speak evil about you and try to soil your reputation. So should we be worried about our reputation? Absolutely, as Christians, we need to put forth the right um, behavior, the right character uh, for the world to see because we are to be a reflection of Christ. On the other hand, understand that 
there will be those who have a certain opinion of you and maybe try to cause others to believe that opinion about you. And there's nothing really that we can do about that. The key is, though, when they speak evil about you, make sure it's falsely, okay? Make sure that, you know, when they say bad things about you, that they're not true. Because if they're true, that's a whole other problem we have to talk about there, and that is hypocrisy. But as long as you're living as you should, we, we can't control what others are going to think about us in some cases. Now, how is it then that we, as people who want to be pleasing to God, who want to reflect that good image of Christ, how do we obtain and, and maintain that good reputation, that good name that God would have us to have. And, and really, this, this isn't difficult. I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't already know. It's just that you must consistently be good and do good. And all of those are important. We need to be good, we need to do good, and it needs to be a consistent behavior on our part. Um, Philippians 4 and verse 9, Paul says the following, to the Philippians, he says, These things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. If you looked at the previous verse, you would also note that Paul points out that when we think on good things and when we focus on the good, we will be good and we will do good. And he's encouraging them to, the things that you received and heard and saw in me, do those things. And if you do that, and if you continue in that, you will gain a good reputation. In regard to how people see us, really the way that we behave the majority of the time is going to determine what our reputation will be. The way that we behave the majority of the time. Are we arrogant or angry? Or are we humble and kind? That is how people are going to see you and what your reputation will be. One important fact when we're thinking about reputation, though, we need to remember is that oftentimes people can change more quickly than their reputation changes. Okay? Maybe we do have an individual who is an angry person or maybe a person who's, who's lazy or whatever it might be, and they have that reputation in the world around them, and and they realize this fault, and they, they strive to get better and be better, and they do that. But that reputation, it doesn't change right away. That reputation, unfortunately, will stick to them for a while until people see consistent behavior of the other kind. And then the reputation, hopefully, Lord willing, changes. We have an example of that, a good example of that in the Apostle Paul. You, of course, know the life that he lived before he became a Christian, how he was an enemy of Christianity, an enemy of Christians, and how he, he went about seeking to destroy the church by destroying the lives of New Testament Christians. And he had that reputation. But, of course, we know that he saw Christ on the road to Damascus. We know that he uh, eventually was baptized, converted, became a proponent of the gospel, a, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And you remember, though, um, during that time that Jesus had appeared to him, God wanted to send a preacher to Saul to teach him the gospel so that he could be saved, converted. And you remember what old Ananias said when Jesus said, I want you to go talk to Saul of Tarsus. Uh, in Acts 9 and verse 13, Lord, I've heard many, I've heard from many about this man. In other words, he's got a reputation, Lord. How much harm he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. Did, did Saul of Tarsus have a reputation? Absolutely, he had a reputation. As a champion of the Pharisees, as a persecutor of Christians, that was his reputation. And not only do we have that, that reputation demonstrated in Ananias, but later on, when after Paul has been converted and he tries to go to the church in Jerusalem and, and, and join up to it, in verse 26 of Acts 9, it says, when he had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. So again, here's an example of a person who had changed, but his reputation remained. 
And it took quite a while for people to come around and realize that Saul is not a threat. Saul has changed. His reputation is no longer an accurate representation of who he is. So the key, though, to maintaining a good reputation is, again, consistency and diligence. It, it's, it's a fact, and it's kind of sad, but it's a fact. You can be good and do good 99% of the time, and then 1% of the time be a hypocrite, not behave the way that you're supposed to, and what do you think your reputation is going to be? Your, your reputation is going to be, well, that person's a hypocrite. And so consistency is so very important when we think about our reputation and the name that we have in the world around us. One mistake can ruin everything. And some mistakes are, are bigger than others, of course, and the bigger mistakes are the ones that really get you in trouble. But you have examples, and I could list many individuals, I'm sure you could think of many, of people who had very good reputations, and they were looked up to and admired by, by the world. And then something comes out where they've cheated, they've lied, they've been dishonest. And, you know, maybe that was a one-time thing. Their reputation is soiled. It's ruined because of that one event, that one choice that they've made. Brethren, I hope that we're not guilty of judging people like that. We need to realize that people do make mistakes and that a mistake that they make while, yes, that mistake needs to be dealt with and, you know, repentance needs to be part of, of the resolve there, um, I hope we don't judge people and, and our opinion of them is framed by one simple action, a mistake that they have made. I don't think the Lord judges us that way, and I think we need to be very careful in the way that we look at others as well. As we think about this idea then of of the importance of a good name, the value of a good reputa repu reputation. Um, one, of the, one of the benefits of a good reputation is that many times it will shield you against false accusations. Um, there are, again, as we've said, there are always going to be people who will speak evil against us, and we must make sure that we live in such a way that when others hear that evil spoken against us, they know it's not true. I've used this example before, and I don't mean to embarrass him, but it really made an impression on me. When Dan and Lisa um, started attending here, they hadn't been here very long, but we were at the building working. Lisa was here, maybe VBS or something, and I think she had taken Dan's car keys, and uh, Dan had called to get his car keys back, and, and um, I had talked to him, I, I guess, and I told Lisa, Dan called. He wants his keys back. He was mad. And Lisa just laughed. She said, I know that's not true. I'm like, well, how do you know that's not true? She said, Dan doesn't get mad. And so she knew, she knows her husband, and she knew that that wasn't true because she, she knew her husband. And in the same way, if people know us, and they know that we're honest, we're good people, we're hardworking people, then when somebody else comes into the picture and begins to tell lies, then they know... That's not true. Or at the very least, they know, i got to look into this. I'm not just going to believe gossip. I'll look into it. And if it's true, well, okay, we'll deal with it. But they're not going to simply believe false things that are spoken about you. So, you know, you think about it. You never lie. You're a very honest person, but then you, you lie. And maybe that lie becomes very well known. Well, you're a liar now. That's your reputation. And it takes a lot of telling the truth to get rid of that reputation because people will remember the lie more than they remember the good that you do. But also, keep in mind that, you know, while it's true that people can change for the better, it's also true that people can change for the worse and the reputation sticks with them that they're good when really they're not. So Jesus says... We're not to judge according to appearance, but to judge righteous judgment. We are to be fruit inspectors, so to speak, judge them by their fruits, and not by a reputation that they, a person may have in the world. Also, a good reputation, hopefully, will cause those who speak evil of you to be ashamed when they do that. Paul tells us this in Titus 2, verses 6 through 8. He says, likewise... 
Exhort the young men to be sober-minded. In all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works and doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. You know, the opponents of Jesus kind of dealt with that, didn't they? They couldn't find anything bad to say about Jesus, so you know, they, they found people to lie and to make things up. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes they, they weren't ashamed of it. They had no conscience. They, they didn't mind telling lies. But our job is to live in such a way that when those people do speak evil, they know that they're lying, and others know that they're lying as well. Peter also wrote, having a good conscience that when they defame you, As evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed, okay? So a good reputation will protect us uh, from the false accusations that come against us in the world. Also, a good reputation often will open doors that otherwise might be closed. We we see that in the business world. A company that has a, a good reputation, that has a solid reputation, has been around for a long time and prosperous, Um, that is a very important aspect of Christianity. I mean, of of their work, of their job as a company, to have that reputation. Even a small company can prosper if they're known to be very good, if they do superior work. That reputation is so important. In our efforts to win souls, a good reputation is very important. That's true individually. As as individual Christians, we need to have a good testimony among those who are outside. But also that's true as a congregation. We need to have a good reputation in the community around us. Um, If a church has a reputation as a congregation that is always bickering and fighting with one another, then, then that church, their evangelistic work, is going to suffer as a result of that. On the other hand, um, we're studying Acts on our Wednesday night Bible class, and we're talking about that New Testament church that was established there in Jerusalem and how it prospered. And if you have a church like that, that the members care for one another and there's unity and, and they work with one accord, then that is a very powerful evangelistic tool. So um, a good reputation will open opportunities for us. And also, a good reputation will inspire others, will inspire others. Remember what Paul wrote to the Philippians. In Philippians chapter 1, he makes this statement, Most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident in my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Paul had a reputation. He had a reputation before he was a Christian, and then after he, later on in his life as as an apostle, he had a reputation. And And the brethren knew that Paul was going to speak and teach the truth no matter what the earthly consequences were. And that reputation, that example set by Paul served to embolden others to follow his example. And so our our reputation, the way that we live, can inspire others to live the way that God would have them to live. Now, when Paul was writing to the Corinthians, listen to what he says to them in in chapter 9. Concerning the ministering to the saints, he's talking about the collection he was taking for the saints in Jerusalem. He said, it's, it's superfluous for me to write to you, for I know your willingness, about which I boast of you to the Macedonians, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal has stirred up the majority. And you think about all the problems that that congregation had that we see in, in 1 Corinthians, For Paul to be able to say this here in 2 Corinthians, it's amazing. But he's saying, you have a reputation, Oren. I'm telling everyone about you, about your willingness to contribute, about your generosity, and your zeal, your reputation has stirred up others, encouraged others to strive to be better and to do better themselves. So there are many benefits to a, a good reputation in the world around us. It protects us from those false accusations. We serve uh, as a good example to others. Opportunities are open to us in the world, especially in evangelism. 
On the opposite side of that, though, as we begin to wind down, we also understand that a bad reputation can cause a lot of problems. Even if that bad reputation is undeserved, a bad reputation can cause problems. Bad reputations tend to feed upon themselves. A good repu as I said, a good reputation will shield you from accusations. A bad reputation does the exact opposite. If you have a bad reputation, then people are going to be more likely to believe accusations against you. And even if those accusations aren't true, which as we see in the world, many times that's the case, they're not true, but this person has a reputation, so they are quick to believe. And whereas a good reputation will open doors of opportunity to us, a bad reputa reputation will close doors. People will not be interested. If they, if they do not already have an opinion of a positive nature formed about us. And whereas a good reputation will encourage others, a bad rep, rep why can't I say that? A bad reputation in the world around us, it will discourage others uh, and cause them to not live the way that they should many times. And I think probably, very important, should be very important to a Christian and something that we need to realize, and that is that when we don't live the way that we should, when we're not consistent in our godly behavior, and we behave in worldly ways, ways that are not fitting for the Christian, that does great harm to the cause of Christ, to the church. Even if we don't realize it, it does. And that was one of the things that that Paul mentioned here in, in Romans chapter 2. He says, you say, do not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through breaking the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. Now Paul, speaking to the Jews there, he says, because of your behavior, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles. And the same could be said of us if we don't live the way that God would have us to live. If we're hypocritical and, and we preach one thing but practice another thing, that is going to hurt the cause of Christ. And that is going to give ammunition to those who desire to blaspheme God. It's not justified. It's certainly not God's fault that we're not living the way that we should. It doesn't matter. They'll blaspheme God as a result of that. We don't want that. We want God to be glorified, and we glorify God by maintaining as much as is humanly possible within ourselves that good name and that good reputation in the world around us. Again, and the, the best way, the only way to do that is to be and do good on a consistent basis, and you will have that good name. As we conclude our lesson today, we want to take a moment to offer an invitation. Again, we have a few here and we have many watching online. If there are any watching who are not members of, of the Lord's Church, any who are here who are not members of the Lord's Church, we want to offer you an opportunity to become a Christian, to have your sins washed away. We talked a lot about Paul today and talked about his reputation both before and after he became a Christian. Well, Paul is a wonderful example to us of, of a person who was ignorant, learning the truth, and then obeying the truth when the truth was revealed to them. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then please make the decision to obey his will, which involves turning from your sins, confessing verbally your faith in Christ, and then submitting to being baptized as Saul did. Acts 22 and 16, Arise and wash away your sins, he was told, calling on the name of the Lord. If you've not done that, we offer you an opportunity. If you're watching online and you want to become a Christian, we encourage you to make contact with us. And we'll be glad to, to talk with you, to study with you, and to baptize you if you so desire. If you're a member of the church and you're not living the way that you should, maybe you've Maybe you fall into this category of what we've been talking about of a person who you've not been living as a Christian ought to live and you've brought reproach upon the church, you've brought reproach upon the Lord by your actions. Or 
Maybe there's something else going on in your life that you just need the prayers of the church for. Again, we'd be glad to help you um, and pray for you. Let us know, and we'll do whatever we can. So um, if there are any who need to respond, we encourage you to do so. Let us stand and sing. Have I no way? service was beneficial to you and hopefully look forward to that time soon where we shall be able to be together in person for our closing song today let's sing 842 number 842 common love 842 842 <clears throat> a common love for each other Before we go to God in prayer this morning, one correction on the announcements. Uh, my cousin Lori's husband, Tommy, his wish was not to have any sort of service. He will be cremated and they won't do their uh, private family burial. But my uncle, Roy Lee, who passed away a couple weeks ago, my mom's brother, I will be doing the service for him when that time comes. So just want to make that correction. Let's go to God in prayer. Our most gracious and loving Father in heaven, we're so very thankful for the opportunity we've had today to come together with our brothers and sisters in Christ and worship you. Father, we pray that all that we have said and that has been done here today has been pleasing in your sight. Father, we're so thankful for your son Jesus and the great sacrifice that he has made that day on the cross that we could have that hope with you in heaven someday. Father, we're so very thankful that we have your written word. We have the Bible, which instructs us on how we are to live our lives and how we conduct ourselves. But most importantly, Father, we're thankful for your plan of salvation that will ultimately lead us to you in heaven someday. Father, we ask that you please be with many of our number who are 
away from us who are sick. Father, we ask you to be with our sister Tara Vargo as she is battling many health problems. We just ask your blessings for her. Also, Father, we ask that you please bless her mom, Peggy, as she travels to see her. Father, we ask you to be with Sister Tisha's sister and her husband as they are battling COVID. We just pray that things will go well for them, that they'll be able to have a full recovery. Father, we ask you to be with Teresa Scott, as she is also battling COVID, and also thankful for Johnny Scott as he is recovering from the COVID that he has had. Father, we ask that you please be with all those that have lost loved ones recently. My mom's brother, Roy, and also John Arbenthroth, as he has passed away. Father, we just ask that you please be with them and bless the families as they go through this time of grieving. Father, we ask that you Please go with us as we start a new week this week, that you will help to keep us safe. Father, we ask that you please forgive us of those things that you see wrong in us, Father, and help us to overcome them in the future. All these favors and blessings we ask in Jesus' dear name. Amen. 